The basic square patient is one you must have a qualifying condition, and that is listed in the Act and also on our new brochures. We've changed them a bit. So in the center page, I don't know if these reflect that, but you'll find the conditions. <clears throat> you need a doctor recommendation. We, it's always preferred that you can see your own doctor and have that relationship so they completely understand your over health care, overall health care. But some doctors don't accept it or they work for hospitals that won't let them. And one way to find out is to call incognito and just pretend to be someone else and ask someone at that office if your doctor their signs um, recommendations for patients that need it and see what their response is. And if not, then don't ask them. There are um, many doctors, well not many, but there are doctors, good doctors like Dr. Newman that understand and will see you and um, you can consult with them. And so once your doctor uh, has recommended and signed your paperwork, you'll complete your paperwork. Don't wait to send it in. I'm looking for a caregiver. If you don't have a caregiver, assign yourself and send in your paperwork. And you can always change that. It's $10 to change that, but it'll begin and get you started. And you should make at least two copies and then the original and um, send it certified mail. It doesn't have to be signed receipt. You have to wait 15 days by law, it says in the Act. And if you don't hear from them, you can assume that you are at that time uh, legal to use medical cannabis. It doesn't mean that they can't come back at a later date, but they have 15 days by law to let you know. And definitely understand your rights in the Act because it changes a lot sometimes every day if there's a new court case that's ruled on or pending or house bills. Uh, we usually know about the house bills, but sometimes there's court rulings that can change things on, on a day basis. So make sure you understand your rights in the Act. One of the best ways is the guide to understanding the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, which we're really proud of. I don't think I have, I know Mish is gonna go get one. We understood that uh, many people we would ask, how many people, and I'll ask now, how many people here have actually read the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act? And shame if you did raise your hand. A lot of people haven't read it. And it's just not something, you know, people don't always know where to find these things or to find the act or find house bills <clears throat> or to understand court rulings or how to read them or what impact and what it means. So Brad Forrester, a gentleman we've known from the very beginning, and he absolutely uh, is definitely into curriculum, pulled together this information and looked for a sponsor. And uh, Mish uh, recognized the importance of this right away. And we uh, worked together with him and brought more uh, information. And we're uh, very proud of this. This has the act in it. It has every house bill that's been passed since the act. And every court ruling, that has changed or had an impact on us as patients and the act. The only ruling or the court case that's not in here is the Carruthers because it's going to the Supreme Court and it's still not decided on. So it's um, a great guide to have and this is how we pulled it all together and we're hoping that this can get into the hands of everyone. We will talk about what we did and handing them out at Carmano's here in a second. Um, so that's it for the, uh, the basis, basics for a patient. Basics for caregivers is you must be assigned by a patient. You cannot be considered a caregiver unless you have an assign, a patient assigned to you. A lot of people get confused when they are their own caregiver. You are a patient who are assigned your own plants. At that point, you're not really considered a caregiver. So understand that. You can call yourself a caregiver if you want. You're caregiving yourself, so you're a patient who's allowed to grow their own plants, and a caregiver is assigned a patient who he grows plants for. And you cannot have any felonies in the past 10 years, and you can never have had an assaultive felony. This is one of the things, if you don't keep up on what's happening in the state and with the laws, is that changed. It used to be that you couldn't have any drug-related felonies. The Act read that you couldn't have any drug-related felonies in the state of Michigan. Well, on April 21st, if you weren't keeping up with things, it changed. If you didn't know that, then you would be breaking the law. So that's just how quickly things can affect you. So just know, um, if you haven't heard this since April 21st, that you cannot have any felonies in the past 10 years, and you could never have had an assaultive felony. <clears throat> you must obtain approval from the state also. 
and understanding your rights in the Act is real, um, real, real important. So those are the basics. If you have any questions beyond that, Ms. Shai, Glenda, Jim, any, um, lots of our chair members can help you if you're new and you don't understand, please don't leave without asking. We want to make sure that you uh, understand everything before you leave. Any questions now? How many people here are new? Welcome. I don't want to skip over this, and it reminded me yesterday, and I talk, I've talk. i probably brought this out maybe four or five times since we've been doing meetings in the, over the last five years, and there was a really nice lady at the post office, a nonprofit, and her husband had a stroke, and she reminded me again it would be a good time to bring this out. So um, it's pretty basic here. Um, you can save someone's life by sharing this, and I found it uh, probably three, four years ago. Stroke, remember the first three letters, S-T-R. My friend sent this to me and encouraged me to post it and spread the word, and I agreed. If everyone can remember something this simple, we could save some folks. Stroke identification. During a party, a friend stumbled and took a fall. She assured everyone that she was fine and just tripped over a brick because of her new shoes. They offered to call an ambulance. They got her cleaned up and got her a new plate of food. While she appeared a bit shaken, Ingrid went about enjoying herself the rest of the evening. And Ingrid's husband called later telling everyone that his wife had been taken to the hospital at 6 p.m. Ingrid passed away. She had suffered a stroke at the party. Had they known how to identify the signs of a stroke, perhaps Ingrid would be with us today. Some don't die. They end up in helpless, hopeless conditions instead, and it only takes a minute to read this. A neurologist says that if, it, if he can get to a stroke victim within three hours, he can totally reverse the effects of the stroke. Totally. He said the trick was getting a stroke recognized, diagnosed, and then getting the patient medical, medically cared for within three hours is pretty tough. To recognize a stroke, remember the three steps, STR. Sometimes symptoms of a stroke are difficult to identify. Unfortunately, the lack of awareness spells disaster. The stroke victim may suffer severe brain damage when people nearby fail to recognize the symptoms of a stroke. Now doctors say a bystander can recognize a stroke by asking three simple questions. Ask the individual to smile, that's the S, the smile. T, talk, ask the person to speak a simple uh, sentence coherently. Is it sunny out today? R, ask him to raise his or her, both of her arms his or her arms, both. If he or she has trouble with any one of these tasks, call the ambulance and describe the symptoms to the dispatcher. Note, another sign of a stroke is ask a person to stick out their tongue. If the tongue is crooked, if it goes to one side or the other, this is also an indication of a stroke. A prominent cardiologist says if everyone who gets the status shares it, it can be the best, it can be at best at least save one life. And the reason that the it, stroke has come to my mind, I know three people who've had a stroke in the land, and it was all within one week, and I was like, wow, this is a lot, and they were fortunately all okay. I probably know a dozen people in my life who have had a stroke, and some people aren't as fortunate. So if we can just recognize those few things, or if you're talking to someone and they don't seem coherent, or something just seems off, or even in yourself, recognize, and it's hard for people who are going through it to recognize, but pay attention to numbness. I know uh, an, an activist uh, in the community had, was one of the ones who had a stroke, and she's not that old, and um, she caught it right away. A friend of hers caught it because she said she felt numb on one side. So notice those things. It was little things that these people said they felt, the other person was my mom, and she's 87, and she's, I can't keep up with her, but she said she bent down and got up, and the one side she had, like, it was blacked out in front of them and her dog. So they did some tests and said that she had a minor stroke. So these are little things to just keep your eye out for, and uh, this lady right here works really hard. I'll tell you what, she loaded everything probably that we load up every week coming in here all by herself and she was little and, and just a thin lady and she was in her 60s and she was as smart as could be and she was happy to be there and she wanted to make sure that everyone knew about a stroke so I made sure we came here tonight and reminded everyone about these important <laughs> topics. So I hope you remember those things. Any questions? Um, 
City of Romulus. I think we told everyone that in order, we are 501c3, I didn't say that in the beginning, but our organization is the first 501c3 in Michigan. There are four in the country, so we're very unique. And we are now just like any other 501c3 organization who's educating and has a mission. And not just like, but what we can do is benefit from what is um, the state gives to these to our 501c3s to help us raise funds because we don't have stores and we don't sell things and we're not profiting, we're really educating and part of that is gaming and that's millionaire parties, that's bingo like the churches and the schools do and it's a way to raise funds and we are at the point that we are able to do this and we made an application and the state said a city needs to recognize you in order for you to do this so Royal Oak recognized us first, and uh, it was a really good feeling to be at the Royal Oak City Council meeting and have them recognize the importance of our organization and vote a super majority vote. I think it was a six to one, uh, something like six, six to one. one, that we be recognized in the city of Royal Oak as a nonprofit for gaming purposes. And we were welcomed by. Um, a couple of the city council after the meeting and our next step was Romulus and we had also applied to Romulus but they were a little more difficult and we actually were founded in Romulus we have a community garden in Romulus and in Royal Oak we have an office and we haven't expanded to that area to really get into the nitty-gritty of the community yet and they approved us so we were waiting and we got it uh, we were approved on Monday with Romulus, so two cities in the state of Michigan have recognized as, as legitimate nonprofits in their city, and that is Romulus and Royal Oak. So we're we're really proud of that, and now we send that information in, and um, we should get our number and be able to begin our gaming, which includes bingo, which includes volunteers, which includes volunteers who can now get paid. <laughs> so that's even more fun. Um, so that's a lot, that's allowed by the state. So we look forward to doing that. Um, <clears throat> some really unique things that I know a lot of people are waiting to hear about is the U.S. Postal Service, and we were there yesterday. Another accomplishment, and most of you know, that we made is the CFC Fair, and um, it took a year to get to the point, but we are in the book. I don't have the book anymore. I <laughs> filed it away, and I don't bring it and show it off, but it's, we are in the CSC, and that's the combined federal campaign where nonprofits in Southeast Michigan, I think it's that area, are in this book. So federal employees can go through it and decide if they would like to donate. And it's um, such an honor to be in this book. We are the first medical cannabis organization to be in it, and in the federal book, it actually says the word cannabis. And so we, uh, there are fairs that you get to reach out to federal employees at, and one is the post office in Detroit. It was an 8 a.m. to 3 a.m. event, so it was a quite long fair. And Mish and I opened up the day, and we were in a room of probably 16 or so other nonprofits that were all lined up, and we uh, we blended right in. We didn't feel any different, uh, didn't, weren't treated differently. I, our banner was up and a lot of people would look at the banner and like take a double look and now just kind of figure out how cannabis leaf could be in a federal building advocating and educating about the act and cannabis. So it was, it was just a great feeling. I don't know what else I can tell you about that. It, it was, uh, you know, from the minute I woke up, all I kept thinking of uh, was Star Trek, where no man has gone before. You know, it's all my day felt, you know. And so, but to be in a federal building and educating is, is, is a light there at that tunnel that's on that just says that we're getting somewhere, you know. And when the public sees that, it's the message they're getting. Holy shit, cannabis is here. It's here. Wow, it's here. It's right in our building. It's here. It is here. It's in your community. And that was the message. Whether you like it or not, it's in your community and we need to educate about it. And that was most of my message is, uh, yesterday to them. And, and, uh, you, you're, you're, and Steve came and helped. Stand up, Jim and Steve. These in Mish, 
This is who manned the 18-hour shift yesterday at the United States Post Office. And did you want to say something? Yes, Here you go. Come on. Uh, most of us are familiar with the term preaching to the choir. That's what we do here. And we educate and we, we help empower all people in this room to go forward with a decision that they've already made to consider cannabis as medicine. But when you go to the United States Post Office, you're going to encounter a whole different kind of people. And I had a man come up to me and he said, what group are you with? And I told him and he's like, oh, I don't believe in alcohol. I don't believe in no drugs. I'm against all of that. That's my favorite kind of person to talk to. Because when we can talk to them, and we can reach them, and we talk to them about five and three and six-year-old children who are having 30, 40, and 100 seizures a day, and they have one in three weeks, and they have their life back, and their parents can sleep at night, we can reach them. And when we reach them, they'll talk about that. This man is not only a father of five, he was a grandfather. He understands what parents go through. So I'm not talking to him about nausea, and I'm not talking to him about chemotherapy. I talk to him about kids, and he gets kids. And he, he took the card, he got a card out of my wallet. He said he got a brochure when he was upstairs, and he even admitted, I'm not, I wasn't sure I was going to read it. He just went around and he grabbed something from every table and he told me outside in front of the building when I went out for a cigarette and I started doing my sales talk with him, he said, I wasn't even sure I was going to read it. That meant he wasn't. Yeah. You know, he'd go through it and circle file that one. He asked for the card. He asked for about our website. I told him about our Facebook page. That's the people we, 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 we meet when we go out to a CFC event, and he's even considering helping to fund us. Thank you. So we did, and, and um, most people, and there were a few that just passed by, but no evil looks, you know, no, what the hell are you doing here? No, just lots of, oh my God, <laughs> or wow, <laughs> or a couple were like, yeah, come over here, come over here. And the lady next to us, the nonprofit, she's like, Man, you have more people talk to you at your table about just about like than anyone, and they do because it's new and it's wow, you're here, and we can actually talk about, we can talk to you about this in public and and understand, you know, and and we gave these guides to everyone. We gave these guides to everyone, and it's funny because some said, oh, okay, it's not for me, it's not for me. I'm going to take it. I know someone. One <laughs> time we didn't care who it was for, they took it, and. Uh, I had a great time. So that's the CFC fair. Hopefully we, Jim, would you like to say something? Come on up. <laughs> so we're talking about experiences yesterday, and uh, I, I knew that when there were some preconceived notions. You know, in Michigan, there's about three different types of people in relation to medical marijuana. There's those who support it, those who are against it, and then those who don't know about it or don't care about it. That's quite a big body of the Michigan population. Um, I'm happy to report two things that I, that I learned last night. Number one, their billboard was seen by quite a few people. It was the first time I ever got direct feedback from anybody as to whether they had seen those billboards on I-75. And uh, number two, I was surprised by the level of education of a lot of people. And uh, there's concern out there in, in the community at large over what's going on with the, the Greens, uh, with this child custody case and cultivating marijuana in their home. And uh, it, the, the, pub, the public at large is concerned with it. They know about it and they, they hear about it and they, they've been thinking about it and talking about it with their families. So I'm really happy to see that. Thank you, Jim. Uh, but I, I do want to, don't sit down, Jim. Here, here, Glenda, come here. And we don't usually have all, many, a lot of us, come on here, I want to introduce everyone. I didn't get to do this, and uh, 
I'd like to introduce everyone to our board of directors. This is Glenda, she is our sec uh, treasurer. This is Jim, he is our secretary. Mish is our vice president, and I am Heidi, and I'm um, your president, the president, and Daniel is not here. Many of you have not seen Daniel in many, many months, and he is our honorary trustee. He made all of the cups. He's behind the scenes. He's not missed a board meeting, but he is very sick, so we don't see him and we never get to introduce him, and I want to thank him publicly for his hard work on getting our coffee cups to us for the weekend. So thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you everyone here who helps uh, work and uh, get this done, so thank you. We talked about the CFC and the post office, and we were like, post office is easy. We've already met lots of postal workers, and Jim talked to them at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, and they're really into us. But our next CFC fair will be quite different because it's at the federal courthouse in Detroit on October 8th. So we will actually be in the federal courthouse educating. And you know who will be educating? The lawyers, the prosecutors, the judges, everyone. Every employee of that courthouse hopefully will walk through that room where we will be with everyone else. And hopefully, we have our state representatives show up and work our section of the booth like they said they would. We're, we're counting on that. So the ones who are pushing forward the House bills, we're hoping they come and, and talk to them there at our booth, and that would have a big impact if our representatives were there. So that's October 8th. We'll fill you in on that one, and we'll go from there. If anyone, they have to understand education is key here because of all of the court cases. And to touch on what Jim said, the Greens, I've seen it on Facebook, but I didn't see it from their mouths. But I've heard from very reliable sources that both of their cases were dismissed in Oakland County. That's huge. Yay. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's huge. The Greens are a couple uh, who ended up with felony, facing felony charges in a court battle and stood their ground to not plea. They wanted them to plea. They would not plea. They wanted a trial and I think uh, they, they two of their attorneys quit. They were a handful. They knew the law. They were going to stand up for their rights and they uh, bucked the system completely. And um, so that is a very positive. The Public opinion, like Jim said, people talked about this, like the case, you know, what, a, what about that child case? And they didn't like it. They didn't think it was right. This is, you're taking a child away here, wait, you know. And they said, what about people who, or, or drug addicts, they don't, it's not in the law to take the children away if you're an alcoholic parent. It doesn't mean you get to have your kids taken away. So people realized that. They were, they, they were for the Greens and thought it was wrong. So public opinion is important, and hopefully it swayed Oakland County to realize that they were looking as shameful as could be, and, and they dropped the case. So that's really good news. <clears throat> uh, hopefully they get Bree back. CPS took their daughter out of the house. It's a whole other case, sad case, another story. They're great parents from what everyone can see, and, and, and we won't go into big detail, but be careful when you have exes involved in your life and you have children and cannabis and things like that, because that's what got uh, this instigated with their case. So Brian's going to talk about CPS and some of the things and, and what they can and do prior to, uh, so you have a better understanding. Brian Crane, our uh, Great attorney, you come and say, you want to come up now and talk about it? Yeah, we can. Sure, I'll talk about it now. I, Curtis? I'd just like to say that I was at one of the hearings when uh, they were discussing the custody case with the Greens, and the judge in that case said he wanted to see what was going to happen in Oakland County. So, well, good. I have a feeling when they go back to court, uh, it's looking pretty good if they're going to end up getting their daughter back. So, okay. From what, I, from what I saw, from what the judge said, he, he basically wanted to see what was going to happen in Oakland County. Good. Well, he saw today that um, Brian's not going to talk specifically about the Greens case and CPS and that, but he is going to talk to you about CPS and what they can, what the rights 